Fill to Capacity, Crazy Good Stories and Timely Topics, Podcast for people too stubborn to quit and too creative not to make a difference, inspiring, irreverent, and informative. Stay tuned. Hi, I'm Pat Benincasa, visual artist and podcaster. Welcome to Fill to Capacity. Today's episode, Three Arts High Schools versus COVID. Adapt, Adjust, Create. My guests are Rebecca Bullen, Brian Gorenson, and Matt McFarlane. Each is at the helm of an award-winning arts high school. And throughout the pandemic, they were able to sustain visual and performing arts classes. Oh, we've got lots to talk about. So welcome. And what I'd like to do, I'll start with Brian Gorenson. I'll give a brief bio of each of you. Uh, Brian is a professional actor and director. He is principal and artistic director at St. Paul Conservatory for Performing Artists, also known as SPCPA. It is a public arts high school, grades 9 through 12, located in downtown St. Paul, Minnesota. He has acted and directed in many productions on local and national stages and at the world-famous Guthrie Theater. When I asked Brian if he preferred acting or directing, he said, quote, I probably am more at home as an actor. It's something that feels just like breathing to me. But I do enjoy facilitating a collaborative experience, be it a play or a school. So, Brian, can you just uh, briefly give us an overview what is a conservatory school? I suppose when you're looking at a conservatory, the simplest definition of it would be that its purpose is to prepare students for life as an artist and to move on into the profession. And that's as simple as it is. It's teaching skills and techniques necessary to be a professional actor, dancer, singer, musician. And now we've added visual arts and creative writing. Okay. Thank you, Brian. My next guest, Rebecca Bullen, is a media artist and assistant principal at the Purpich Center for Arts Education, also called PCAE. It is a residential public arts high school, grades 11 and 12, in Golden Valley, Minnesota. When asked about her media arts practice, Rebecca said, quote, I am most drawn to photography, though I'm most drawn to storytelling. From the perspective of the creator, I love asking questions and finding ways to connect with people and encapsulate moment into a photograph or short video. So, Rebecca, what is unique about Purpich? Well, you named it in that residential. So Purpich is a state-wide arts high school. So we have that residential component. So we're able to have students apply to six different arts areas and can be a student um, at Purpich and stay on Purpich campus. Okay. Uh, and so that's that I would say that was the one of the biggest differences. So students come from across the state and actually can reside on campus. Thank you. My next guest, Matt McFarlane. Matt is a professional musician. His main instrument is piano, although he also plays trombone and has a background in choir music. Matt says, quote, my preferred mode of making music is in collaboration with others. He is executive director at Performing Institute of Minnesota Arts High School, also called PIM, grades 9 through 12 in Eden Prairie, Minnesota. Matt, what is PIM? And as an arts high school, what makes it special? Well, PIM is a 9 through 12 arts high school. 
And I think what really makes us unique and differentiates us is the community approach that our school has. We have, you know, four year long connections with the arts teachers that our students work with. And that really creates a, a really important bond. And we're able to, you know, help the, the young artists grow through that you know, see that spark period, what, you know, you start to see the spark of what they're going to be after they're, you know, with us. High school is such a speculative, (laughs) a speculative adventure because you don't ever really get to see the final product. It's just a, I guess you never see the final product, right? But I think it's, it's more so with high school because they go, you know, they really turn into completely different people in two, three years after they, they leave us. And it's always amazing to see, like, you know, be a part of that, that moment where that spark was created and, Yep. Okay. Thank you. So for those of you who don't know what's special about an arts high school, let me say that in addition to rigorous academics, art students learn their craft on stage or in art, music, dance studios. And student interactions, critiques, collaborations are essential in this dynamic learning environment and where educators are professional artists and performers. Now, key to this experience is this kinetic human interaction. Then, boom, here comes COVID. How on earth Do you do art without critiques? How do you perform without audiences or have students in classroom? What were the early days of COVID like at your school? Who would like to uh, jump in? I guess I can start. Okay, Brian. Uh, It it was brutal. (laughs) I mean, it was really, really brutal. I mean, the first lesson in a theater class is, all right, Let's get in the room together and kinesthetically respond to the energy in the room. And without being able to do that, it was just, just tough. I mean, theater, dance, a lot of the performing arts especially is all about responding to your collaborator in a physical space. And the energy in a physical space is just vastly different, obviously, than the energy, you know, over Zoom or whatever. (laughs) Yeah, Obviously, there was the logistics to figure out. Everyone figured out logistics in different ways because, you know, everyone in education was thrown into this completely upside down environment where where we had to come up with new new ways to do everything, new ways to mm-hmm. to do things. We can talk about the the logistical things that we came up with, you know. But in the early days, you know, honestly, throughout COVID, it really became an act an activity of just caring for the people. It was okay. we were all in crisis and we were all feeling this uncertainty of what this experience was. I'm thinking back to 2019 mm-hmm. and and even through the 2020, even through the, you know, through the 1920 school year, it, it was so much an act of just caring for each other and trying to make, you know, to, to take that next step through life and and create the smallest sense of normalcy for our students who, who, who don't have, you know, no one had the frame of reference for that experience that we're still kind of in, but they certainly didn't. And just trying to make sense of the world and any, any way we were able to offer something artistically that felt even like a modicum of familiar was, was great. So, I mean, it, it, it was, yeah, just like Brian said, though, it was, wasn't my favorite. (laughs) <laughs> well, and I think the most challenging thing to me was, you know, in our case, our mission is to prepare these kids to do this after high school. And suddenly we had the rug pulled out from under us and we weren't about to abandon that mission. And so mm-hmm. we just did everything we could. We stayed in hybrid the whole time and then I moved to, to in fully in person as soon as we could, just because it just felt like we were going home every night after school every day beaten down because we weren't serving the kids with the mission that, you know, is right there in giant letters on the wall as you walk into the school. (laughs) We will prepare you to do this after high school. It's tough. Rebecca, how about you with Perpich? Yeah, I think building off from, you know, some of Brian and Matt's responses, of course, initially it was kind of a hands up, what are we going to do? And, uh, and that was really, we had had the experience of working with the students for a fair amount of time before they had to leave, which was very different than the second year where students were coming in with masks. And so 
there's been multiple layers of challenges and processes to get to, I think, where we are now in more of a reflective place of, of what have we tried to be in a sense positive of what we've, what we're now reflecting back and what did we learn from this as, as educators, as leaders, and as artists. You know, and initially, as, as Matt said, it was very much about taking care of the students. And so continuing to be beside them to get them to graduation or to get the juniors ready for the next year. And so that very immediate responsive, what's the core of what we need to do right now? It's that we're taking care of the students. We didn't have time to, because we have students across the state, we didn't even really have time to prepare them to get them supplies. Equity-wise, that's challenging because when we have students that are four, six hours away, we can't really ask them to come in and, and get supplies on a regular basis. So we had to think about that. So there was a lot of hands on deck in terms of what can we do in response, moving on to the next year, a little different in that at least we had a sense of of that and could prepare. We were able to do a little bit of a hybrid process in that with the residential component, we set up a system that allowed students to be in a cohort come for a week, go away when we had cohort B come in, then they would go away and cohort C so that everybody had an opportunity to have, as Brian was talking about, we, you know, it's that community connective responsive way. And even within that a week, it's challenging because I mean, unlike the others were two years. And so building that community and way of being and the traditions and all of that uh, have been challenging and so it's 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 rethinking what's most important. What do we hold on to? What do we keep? You know, what do we let go of? Teachers were really great with responding with with new ways of thinking and being in the classroom to creating corpse response to how can we be online? How can we pass things to each other? How do you utilize the supplies that you have around your house to be resourceful yeah. to create supplies? So I think there were some benefits in terms of the resiliency. And as you move forward, you might not have access to all these supplies. So what do you have around you in your house? If I may jump in, you're leading to the next consideration here. Can you guys think of examples as to how your school was there with students as they struggled? Like, what was that journey like? Just some highlights or examples of that struggle and journey. And I'm talking about the early days of COVID. We started with creating right away uh, a day within the week. And we, in response to the students and talking to families, and then as a collective sort of team within the school, created what we call the Wellness Wednesday. So one um, every week on Wednesdays, we would have a non-instructional day. We set up programming throughout that day where we would either have presenters that would do either yoga or they would talk about health and well-being. Uh, there was a time where students, I would just set up a time in different breakout groups for students to come together to play among us, to do draw sorus, to, you know, just do things mm-hmm. that they had generated. There was a, uh, within that, a form that they completed that was a uh, a wellness check. It was just a chart that they looked at that designated where they were within how they were feeling. Um, It listed a place for success and challenges. And then we followed up with all of those students. And so especially if there was a student that was kind of in that struggling place, we would follow up with them. What's going on? How are you doing? What can we do to support you? And that was, and that was something that we continued a bit into the next year, but that was a huge for the students to feel heard, to have that midweek breather, um, a time to connect with teachers. uh, And so that was one of our first um, responses in terms of being with them. Okay. I think early on, we made the choice to, you know, do similar. I think a lot of the things that that we did to be with the students were, were, were non-academic and non-artistic. Okay. Um, just like, you know, in very similar to what Rebecca described. I, I brought on what I call my cruise ship director and her role was to uh, create events for students when we were completely at distance um, for social, for interaction. I guess, you know, I think at the beginning, I'm thinking the beginning of the 2021 school year where we start this whole school year 
and we we stayed in dense we stayed in distance a long time we stayed in distance all the way until quarter four wow. of 2021 that fit that fit the needs of our community i it, you know like i had i had a, a large segment of students and and families that were highly immunocompromised so we did a lot of surveying we did a lot of serving of parents families all that you know i think every school did that but the cruise ship director did a great job of creating you know these social connection moments <laughs> they, they did online games they did online cooking classes we had the same sort of thing where you know you had you know, someone doing a yoga class. I mean, the, the, in that, that, that checking in on where kids were on, on, a, yep. on a personal level. In terms of trying to create art through that whole year, I mean, we the vision, the media classes worked pretty well. We, we had supplies delivered to kids at home. So the kids would order stuff from like a store, uh, wet paint. And and we would, we, the teachers would put together packages, packs and the, the kids would just order the packs. And then for the kids that, you know, didn't have access, we would hand deliver stuff. I did a lot of, I did a lot of road trips um, out to people's houses, delivering things. It was nice to see where people, you know, you get a better idea of your community. And uh, we, we added a digital network, which was a pretty big endeavor to put performing material out. And then we made, you know, thoughtful choices about the material we performed um, we did, we did, uh, we did the Adams family last year as our musical and we, we cohorted every group and we shot it episodically. We filmed it episodically and we did, you know, we, we had the kids controlled in, in control groups. So you was very little mix between groups. It was, it was a logistical, like juggernaut. And then we brought on a, we, we did a sort of an online gallery for our for our visual and media students. And that was pretty cool. So I, we did a lot of things. Like we made sure every kid had a device. I mean, just the, the basics, the nuts and bolts stuff we did. But I think it really, what was what I would say more than anything is trying to continue to give kids an opportunity to interact with other, other kids and other artists was what we where we really tried to put our focus. Because that's, you know, we were sitting, when you're sitting at home in your room, after you've made your nice light set up and you've got your, you got your look going for your, for your zoom. It's like, well, that's what was really missing was the human element. And, and that's, that's yep. the connective piece that, that draws us together as artists. Brian, how about you? Yeah, I, I guess um, with the start of the pandemic, we just made the decision that we were going to focus on doing the best job that we could to continue to deliver SPCPA's mission you know, you know, with all of these obstacles. And so we offered multiple different kinds of schools to families. So uh, we offered a fully distance experience in both arts and academics and the distance experience academically. We purchased an online platform, Edgenuity. But for the arts, we paid arts teachers to create online courses on Google Classroom about, uh, I'd say about 25% of our students through that year uh, chose fully distance for both arts and academics. But then we also offered a hybrid experience where students got to come to school every other day for both arts and academics. And then we also gave students the option to just choose hybrid arts. That was the reason they were choosing to come to SPCPA. Those were students who were anticipating pursuing the arts after high school. So they would come here just for their two arts classes each day and then go home and use the Edgenuity platform to, uh, you know, complete their academic experience at school. So that was really it. We moved our J term in, what was that, 2021 from January. We have a J term in the middle of our year where students apply skills and techniques to, to a professional rehearsal or performance experience. Um, it's super important to the school. We couldn't cancel it. Um, if you don't get the opportunity to, to get that, you're really missing out on the full conservatory preparation experience at SPCPA. So we moved it from January 2021 to June 2021. And the board decided to make J term that year optional for, mm -hmm. for credit. And so we were just trying to find everything we can do to provide whatever specific experiences students and families needed based on where they were at. So we were scrambling, but in the end, I think it was a good call. That's where we put our resources. We did have one person whose daily job it was to check in with students and families who we were losing a little bit of track of during that yep. time. You know, each of you 
has said something remarkable, many remarkable things. But one thing that strikes me, and all of you are professional in your field, you know that when you're in there teaching art, it's about building a trust, that you encourage students to grow the confidence to express themselves. And so trust building is huge when you want kids to really go out there and perform and make art. And what it seemed you guys automatically kicked into was a way of making a continuity of trust and stability for your kids, that somehow you prioritize that as the foundation. If anything's going to happen learning-wise, students have to feel that, that connection. And that's what you did, and each in a very unique way. And part of the reason I wanted to do this podcast for people listening to this, if we are not done with pandemics, if this happens again, the three of you are providing wonderful models and insights into things that other schools could do. So I I just want to put that out there. I'd like to move in a different direction. I stopped teaching just before COVID hit. And this past January, I taught a quarter three class at Perpich. And because I had been studio arts chair at Perpich, I thought, yes, I will just jump back in the classroom and I will just teach. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you, Matt. But I did think that. Now, (laughs) yeah, the post-COVID classroom is very different from the pre-COVID classroom. Now, I had heard this from my colleagues who are teaching in arts high schools, in colleges for the past two years, but until I experienced it, I did not understand. And so, long story short, I observed many things, but the one thing that really jumped out at me was this frenetic need for students to talk and chat and visit throughout the class. Now, for those of you who don't know what an arts class looks like, in the studio arts, students are focused on their work, and sometimes they'll banter, but they're focused on their work. What I was observing was this frenetic need for kids to talk and really connect with one another. And at first I thought, what is going on? And so, as I thought about it, two years of pandemic uncertainty, online classes, a pandemic media frenzy, polarizing commentary, adults bickering about masks, and individual experience, family experiences with COVID have deeply affected these kids. As an educator, I found that I was switching gears throughout the whole experience. Would you agree with my observations? Yeah, totally. And I would add to that, I think the amount of time that they spent on devices unfettered through that period of time yes. has also created this super, fr- it's just it, it aggravated this fractious attention span that it's even it's even more notable than it was pre-COVID. And just their inability to focus, I, I think is largely due to the fact they spent two years on their phone scrolling Instagram, you know, nonstop. Yeah. What's next? 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 Yeah. I think that's, that's one factor, but but kids definitely were different. I mean, we had the experience of coming, you know, kind of fully back in person this fall. And these these kids are different. This has been, a, this is an experience mm-hmm. that has changed kids. Some are more withdrawn. Some are more, you know, a- exaggeratedly animated, like you described, Pat. But we have a lot of healing to do over the next, you know, three or four years. I think it's yeah. going to take a time period. I mean, I'm thinking about even creating a a thematic drive for this next school year around the idea of metamorphosis, where we want to leave, we want to shuffle off the people that we've become over the last couple of years and, and kind of rebirth into, you know, allow ourselves to be new people and let some of that stuff go. But yeah, absolutely, absolutely different, different people. I think Pat too, like that, the idea of being back in the classroom and kind of what that experience was like uh, think another aspect of of COVID and how as leaders and shortages of subs and all sorts of things that Mm. I too have been back in the classroom a couple of times teaching for extended periods of time. And I had certainly observed and certainly had many conversations with instructors about impact and what was happening in the classroom, but actually going in there for a period of time really helped to 
to kind of hone in on, on the experience and what was happening in those struggles and different ways of thinking about how to be in the classroom and the idea that for a sense, two years for our students, their social and emotional development is paused. And I don't think yes. we hear a lot of this idea of like learning loss. And I don't really see it so much as a loss. It's just a pause. There's a pause mm-hmm. where they were in their rooms. And now we, you know, as new, let's say 11th graders coming in, they're really ninth graders coming in. And it's not yep. that they intend to be, or they want to be, or they're trying to be anything other than themselves where they are. And so we as educators just need to rethink how we're approaching that situation. And so I think it's different learning techniques, different processes of trying to bring them back in, kind of calling them back in and and teaching them what it looks like to be in a space. There's, as you talk about kind of that banter, sometimes it's good banter, right? They're talking about Mm -hmm. their work. And sometimes there's that level of, Ooh, that's not really, yes. Let's rethink what you're saying. Let's talk (laughs) about that. And so there's the creative aspect. And then there's also this level of let's talk about what it's like to be a human in a creative environment, which is a whole other level. Nice way of putting that. Yes. Brian, I don't know if I don't know if you signed up for running a middle school, but uh, <laughs> I sure feel like I'm a, I'm a middle school principal this year. <laughs> yep. Yep. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say. Everything that Rebecca and Matt said. And, and our, our ninth and 10th graders are really seventh and eighth graders socially, yep. emotionally. We do here, since the purpose is to train in the arts, we do notice a big gap. We have ninth and 10th graders who've never been in a play before or have never been in a dance piece before, and a lot of them. And so we're just trying to catch them up in that way as well. But the phones, they are absolutely, their souls are connected to those phones. And they're living their lives through those phones. And we're trying to teach them a a sort of live, in-the-moment experience, void of technology, usually. And just getting them to disengage with that for a second has been really tough this year. Yes. Yep. So moving from micro to macro realities, We know these kids have experienced a changing world in trauma and uncertainty. So now we have to go back to the drawing board and embrace new experimental ways of creating and connecting. Now, Matt, you touched on it by maybe introducing this theme of metamorphosis, but it seems that it's not business as usual for the next school Mm -hmm. year. So what are some of your thoughts about engaging in that. When you come back in the school year, you know, developmentally, these kids stopped growing at when they had to stay home for a year. So like you had a middle school instead of a high school, their personalities and their connection to digital devices. At first, I agree with you. I was looking at, it was like they had a paintbrush in one hand and the phone in the other. Now, before COVID, I would say, excuse me, you know, put the digital devices away. But I didn't this time because it dawned on me. I almost saw those as a lifeline, as mm-hmm. if they were as if they were on the side of a sinking boat. And that digital device, come hell or high water, was going to be the one connection that they had and they were not going to give up. Yep. So how do we go back into this new school year embracing new ways of connecting and creating? Any thoughts on that? You know, we use the phrase compassionate flexibility a lot over mm. COVID. That was sort of one of our mantras that we, compassionate flexibility. How can we, how can we demonstrate compassionate flexibility? And I think one of the challenges this year for, you know, this 21, 22 kind of version of COVID <laughs> has been, there's times now where that's not the best mode and we're having something firm for the kids to push up against has actually been better. And knowing when to bring back those sort of, you know, firm growth elements has been tricky. Also knowing Mm -hmm. when to be flexible. I think that's been the biggest challenge for us this year is like, okay, when should we flex on this? Are we still doing this? Are we doing this? Is this still good? But one of the most brilliant things I saw this last week, we started our fourth quarter. I had an English teacher who had a pretty large class and she could not get a sink. She couldn't get any participation at all. Kids would just, she'd say something, kids just look at her. She'd ask a question. It was like back to Zoom screens with just the names, you know, 
where the kids wouldn't even show their screens. It was like that in person. She took that class out of the classroom and they are meeting this quarter in a dance studio and they're moving around and they're being Whoa. physically active. And she said, it's like night and day. The kids are talking. The kids are, it's the kids are like interacting. Like these the kids, these kids, some of our kids, and we're, we're pretty vis heavy right now at PIM. Mm-hmm. Thanks, Pat. And that vis kid, you know, getting some of those kids to crack out of their shell a little bit, especially after a traumatic experience, you know, yeah. it takes, takes really creative measures. Yep. I, I, all of that is happening here as well. I mean, just sometimes getting them to, to do something or even want to do something has been such a big challenge this year. And we want to be compassionate and we want to be flexible. But at the same time, as teachers, we have to help them understand that in order to grow, you need to have obstacles and you need to learn how to overcome the obstacles. Yep. And you need to get on your feet and do something. And that's our responsibility as teachers. And so we're really moving in that direction again right now of mm-hmm. pushing at them harder and making them do stuff that they don't want to do. And sometimes we get a little pushback from parents when we try to do that. Yeah. But <laughs> the reality is, is uh, otherwise you're just going to sit there and we will not have met our mission. The second thing, the one thing that we did do this year that was helpful in this area was We went around and challenged all of our seniors this year to take the ninth and 10th graders under their wings in multiple different kinds of ways. Hmm. And all of our seniors went around in panels, group discussions with all of the ninth and 10th graders in all of their academic classes prior to the J-term experiences to talk about how to be a professional in that experience, to talk about uh, focus and engagement and being a professional in a professional space. And that helped a lot. They heard it from them in a, in a much uh, better way than they, mm-hmm. uh, they weren't listening to us. So, <laughs> yeah, I think similarly, it's, there's that sense of, in terms of not knowing when to kind of push back. I remember having conversations earlier on about that, the idea that they are so focused on trauma and the struggle of this. Yeah. There was a lot of time spent where there was this worry of, are, are we going to go back to distance? Are we going to, and so it, it took a while to get through that. And then that sense of from, from, you know, the, the adults, the educators in the building to not know when to push. And is that going to be the breaking point for the student and how do we support them to now having developed those relationships that are now saying, okay, we've stood by you. We continue to stand by you at the core of everything we're doing. It's because we care about you and we want to provide you with the life skills, which mean you need to show up, you know, you need to get out of bed on time to come to class, you, you know, practice this. We're giving you these opportunities to practice. And then I think bringing in, recognizing some of the struggles that we see, for example, the phones and bringing back some of those middle school or early things like let's now, let's test your learning with this Kahoot, bring your phone out. Like we're going to use that device in a way and in this moment of, right, we're in the classroom, I see they're participating in this, they're they're showing their learning, they're making risks by making mistakes, and then they're able to put that away. So giving them times where it's like, okay, we're going to do this, and then you get, you can have like five minutes, go to your phone, go do Mm -hmm. whatever you need to do, and then let's come back and regroup. And so tapping into some of maybe those tools and techniques that were utilized at earlier times but also recognizing, okay, here we are, like rec- yep. this, this has been really hard and we do need to have some accountability and you do, you, this is the perfect space. You have all these people who are here beside you, make mistakes, practice, and, and will continue to be beside you. Well, this brings me to a really, one of those mega questions. Will arts education be forever changed from COVID? Absolutely. Uh-huh. No, I, I would say for sure, for sure. I think that the impactful changes in the sense of at the very core thinking about creative thinkers. And I really believe that artists think and interact differently than yeah. artists and finding new ways to reach our students. For us as a, again, state agency reaching people from across the state of Minnesota, the new things that we've implemented, you know, Matt talked about this earlier too, having galleries online, that this is like a new way of sharing their art form that can reach people in a much further space than their galleries within our school. 
sharing out streaming our performances and what that looks like and the connection of that. Um, so there are, are different ways of sharing their art form. I think also at the at, at another really valuable thing is getting back to the whole student and thinking about, and mm -hmm. for me, thinking about what is education and why are we doing this and what's the goal? And is this something that we really need to do just because it's been done for 20 years? Like, let's think about what our goals are and how we can support our students artistically in that process. I think it's interesting. One of the first things to go right at the beginning of COVID was standardized testing, right? And mm -hmm. we all kind of got back, kind of got by mm -hmm. it, right, didn't we? And like mm -hmm. schools haven't been asking for the ACT, these things that are a, a measure of a very small portion of who our, our students are. We all have to uh, report our students' growth and our students' ability in many different areas but usually it's it's the big two or you know math and reading and and that's such a small measurement of who, who these kids yeah. are and I just think it's interesting that that was one of the first things to, to go by the wayside and and uh, of course those things are kind of those those things are also creeping back in I think arts I think all education has changed it will be changed permanently but arts education especially because the people have changed we're all different humans after this experience. Yeah. And every kid coming past this, you know, like I, I think about my grandmother talking about the Great Depression and how formative that was in her mindset. Mm -hmm. I, I'm confident that we'll be talking about the pandemic in the same way 30 years from now. So I, I think one of the interesting things is it's been interesting to watch how the students art has changed. Like in the middle of COVID, it was really dark. It was the art, yeah. the art that kids were creating was very, very dark, but there's certainly positives. You know, the, the kids spent a lot more time creating online, creating in the digital realm, musically speaking, kids learned how to, to mix the, you know, mix a choral piece together. You know, all those things that never really existed more than, you know, Eric Whitaker doing his online choir, but now everyone, every church director in, in America has done an online choir now, right? Mm -hmm. So, and the kids, the kids who were a part of that too, but, but more than anything, I think we'll appreciate a, a, every time I've been in a live performance space since, man, the level of appreciation for the ability to be in that space with these people yeah. and experience this thing is through the roof. I don't think that'll get old for me any, anytime soon. Mm -hmm. Like I went and saw uh, the Minnesota Orchestra with Cloud Call last weekend, and it was one of the most ecstatic experiences I've had in a long time. And I don't even know that band. <laughs> <laughs> I do now. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't have much to add here with the, ex, you know, that, that's that been my experience, too, that if anything, the pandemic has just sort of reinforced the idea that humans crave a live interactive experience. Our kids just want it now in some ways more than ever before. I do think, though, that we'll see more interaction with technology as a result of all of this. I mean, all these kids are now making films on their phones I um, mean, that's a good thing. That's a good thing, I think. I think academically, one of the things we learned was, you know, as we moved uh, away from grades for about a year and a half to just sort of pass fail, like, what does a grade mean anyway? And what's the point of it? Is it to separate the students so that moving forward, you'll do this gig and you'll do this gig based on, you know, what grade you have? Grades for us have really almost lost their meaning. In our arts classes, it's always been about, you know, you don't grade production or talent, you grade engagement to us to, for the most part. But academically, we started to see those teachers move in that direction as well. They started to just attempt to engage students as best they could, disregarding what kind of, you know, grade the student received in the end. Well, you guys are hitting on something very interesting here. During COVID, theaters, museums, galleries, orchestra, and music venues all closed. And traditional gatekeepers were no longer in charge. And oh. artists, poets, performers, writers, what did they do? They went to social media. And what did they do? They used the internet to make their work visible. And it's interesting to me that art schools instinctively shifted into that same mode in order to make visible what these young artists and performers were doing. So... If we could just move into yet another direction, because this has really made me think about what does it mean to make art in a crisis? Because if we've learned anything from COVID, 
the idea and the presence of art at a time when we all shared this global pandemic and now with the war in Ukraine, you know, what is it to make art in crisis? What does that mean? I feel like we within our classroom started having a lot more conversations about the responsibility of artists. I think in particular, you know, within the Twin Cities and at the time of COVID and the murder of George Floyd and the response of students and this happening within their community, that that became a huge, like within crisis, there's that responsive mode. And what do you do? And do you shut down? Right. Because for a lot of our students, they they were just, they were dealing with just being, that was like a big part of it. Like their energy just went towards being in the world. And then for some, that sense of taking that being and being active, like thinking about their responsibility and their voices as an artist. And I I believe that that's carried on. And it's also crisis mode has broken down some of the silos um, Mm -hmm. that existed between the art forms. So example being the dancers can't come together to make their piece. So they're working on a production and they're understanding then what filmmaking looks like and what goes Mm. into that and how do you get that out there and what's the music part of it. And so suddenly there are these different ways to interact, to, to collaborate, to learn about art. And again, back to their, their responsibility, their yeah. voice, sharing their stories. So that sense of art continuing to be that connective tool. And I think, you know, again, crisis mode at the core of that, that is something that we continue to talk mm-hmm. about and, and, and asking those questions. Doesn't art, didn't, doesn't art go from being like that thing your dad doesn't want you to do, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, you, to becoming like the most important thing in a crisis. It's like mm-hmm. the one thing that's the salve of that whole, the, the, the moment, like you have to create art because what else would you do? I, I think about, you know, it, the really toughest moments of this experience from a personal perspective, the, the moments that were most gratifying to me were moments where I was making art. And hopefully other people were experiencing that as well. You know, art can serve so many different purposes, but I think in a crisis, it just becomes vital. It just, everything comes into focus in that moment. Whereas like, we all think, you know, the the traditional thought process is, well, the business is most important. The the dollar is most important. No, like treating your soul is most important, right? Yeah. Especially when we're in these dark, dark moments. That's my thought. I, uh, I, I feel that amongst our, our student body and our faculty, all of our, our teachers here are working professionals. It, it kind of depended a little bit on their artistic discipline. Our visual arts students, our creative writing students, uh, a, lot, a lot of our musicians flourished in a way. They found ways to, to get their work out there and to create work. Some of the, those disciplines are less collaborative than others. Our theater students, our dance students, our theater teachers felt that the rug had completely been pulled out from under them and they didn't know what to do in a lot of cases. Um, They were struggling to find that creative outlet to express what they wanted to express this time. A play on Zoom is not a play. And a lot of them just kind of shut down for two years. And I think, you know, there's there's some fallout from that. They gave it up. A uh, few left their careers behind. So it, it, it really kind of depended on their discipline. Yeah, the theater perspective, I thought was really cool. I had a teacher that kind of gave the perspective that this was an incubation period, you know? Yeah. So you can't be out and you can't be doing it, but you can be incubating and coming up with new ideas. And I'm, I, I'm surprised there hasn't been more of a, uh, just an overwhelming outpouring of, of new albums and new art, and new plays. Mm-hmm. And I, I, maybe that's still in the hopper, new movies, right? I thought one of the coolest things that that I saw was the opportunity to connect with people you wouldn't have been able to connect with under normal circumstances, like people in an upper echelon of theater, people on Broadway, people doing professional stuff that didn't have anything to do. (laughs) They were sitting at home on Zoom, too. So let's like we had teachers that connected with pretty significant names and gave kids the opportunity to interface. I mean, that was a creative opportunity. I mean, does that replace doing live theater? Well, come on. But it was cool. Yeah, I think we'll see. I think we'll see work come out of this. I, I totally agree with that. You know, I know a lot of theater artists who they didn't even want to train in this period because, you know, they didn't want to get in a room and wear a mask. I mean, an actor has three physical tools, right? Your body, your your voice and your face. And you take one of those tools away and 
there are a lot of repercussions of that, including the creation of bad habits. You're going to overcompensate with your body and you're going to overcompensate with your voice to communicate what your face is unable to communicate in the rehearsal hall. And I see that at school on a daily basis. And so uh, most of the folks I know in, in that discipline just kind of hid under a rock for a couple of years. And I think Matt's right. I think we'll see some things that come from that. Well, I was just going to say, it's it's kind of just that interesting kind of balance between I also saw, Brian, kind of that sense of the, the departure from or even within our students where they just really, again, shut down, like being creative. Yeah. There was nothing that happened. Mm-hmm. It was really challenging to support even to get anything from them because there was that level of shutdown because yeah. their very sense of, of being and how to be creative was just thrown out, thrown up in the air. And within trying to process all of that, that very, as Matt referenced, that very sense of being and what would typically get you through didn't feel like it was helping either. So there was, you know, it really has kind of been this juggle of people being in different places in terms of of how they move forward or pause or move forward. Mm -hmm. One of the things, uh, Matt, you touched on it early on about uh, art being uh, food for the soul. When COVID first hit in terms of lockdowns, I mean, if we just go back to that time for a moment, when all of a sudden we're hitting this global lockdown, I don't know if you remember, but immediately they were showing Italians going out to the balconies, performing music singing. And it wasn't just one, it just spread all over Italy, this moving towards music as connection. And I saw that and it was like this magnificent defiance that in the face of this, this, this lockdown, this fear, this uncertainty, it's the arts. They go to music. And for Ukraine, artists are doing artworks. They're going into these bombed out areas to build a sense of community, to bring attention to the suffering. The murals during George Floyd and the outrage. Again, it's this this magnificent ability of the arts that all this polarity, all this rage and all this frustration, there are the arts making a way to be heard, to be seen, to be communicated. And if anything, in this last two years, just seeing these spontaneous outbursts of art in all aspects of society was really breathtaking. Well, I'd like to ask, can you think of just a few things that were positive outcomes from these past two years that strengthened your students and your schools? Something positive that came out of this? Well, you know, in our case, when we challenged those seniors at the beginning of the year to take those ninth and 10th graders under their wings, we saw them become mentors like never before. I mean, they're usually, they've usually been good with that. But unlike any other year, they recognized that those ninth and 10th graders were behind socially, emotionally, their skill level was behind. Mm -hmm. And they mentored them through this year. And You know, I think that's a gift that they gave the students and that will come back on them as they move on into a a new environment next year as the new person Mm -hmm. in an established space. Yeah, I think from from a school perspective, this I mean, this is just this is completely like like school school business. But from, from a school perspective, the knowledge that with just a little bit more money, just a little bit, a little bit more money. We can do a lot of things. It's been uh, just managing school budget over the last, you know, couple of years with the money that's come from, you know, from ESSER funds and from other places. It's incredible how much how much we've been able to do with just a little bit more money, you know, just a little bit more support. But I, I think more importantly, I think the, the positive that is really how much the kids now really value and appreciate the moments that they're having. And I see it in them. <sighs> Like when we have when we have a no shame performance, which is like our our monthly variety show. Right? The kids just like just the fact that they're like, oh, I can come in here, I, I can be here with each other. We don't have to watch it on a screen. You know, like the ability, like when just started doing dance classes again in in person, and just watching the the backside of a tough thing occur. You know, it was a really it's a really tough thing that we did, and and hopefully the long term effect of that is is a greater sense of resilience. And kids knowing they can do tough things because they just did a tough thing. I'm hoping that's the long-term 
impact. And that's how I continue to try to spin it for them. <laughs> you did a really tough thing. You can yeah. go to block three. You can go to block three. <laughs> you just did a tough I, I would totally build off from that. Same thing. Just that sense of young artist feeling seen, feeling, you know, heard, feeling supported that there is this group of art, artistic thinking, creative minds, teaching artists, working with them to help them to be successful on the next step, that there yeah. is that like group of people that even during these really hard times are, are continue to be there, that even when they feel like they might be being their worst selves or mm -hmm. stuck, that there is this community of people that are there to support them and to help push nudge them a, a bit um, as they, you know, need that extra encouraging thing. And again, that idea of showing them and being there and creating space where they can hold a talent show or they can have their regular production or their exhibition. And then to look back and say, again, look what you did, look what you did. Yep. Um, and being able to provide that space for them to grow and be in the world and to, and to feel good about it, even within those challenges. Well, as we wind down and end our discussion, I'd like to ask you to finish with, if you could say anything to your school community about what we've gone through, what would it be? I think it would just be that. Like you, you all stayed together as a community and you saw what we could do through really, really tough times. And you, you saw who, who we are and you saw the, the metal of, of how we care for each other as a community. And when things occur and things come up over the next, you know, number of years you're with us or, or even beyond, just, just know that you always have this community here and we always care about you. And I think we proved that through this experience and we can't wait to see the great art you make from this experience. And this, it, it, nothing gives me greater joy than than seeing the the works that are inspired by our, uh, our students create. That's why we do what we do, right? Yep. Otherwise, we'd just be out performing and creating our own art, right? <laughs> we feel some, some level of obligation to pass this great, great, this great element, you know, this great thing that we know about onto the future. I would say the the power of art and the, the power of creativity as a tool to connect has really been at the core of, of the challenges over the last couple of years and continues to be. And that the, the growth that I've seen within students in developing empathetic ears and hearts and, and, and finding mm -hmm. ways to be present in struggle has been phenomenal. And I have found myself in observing our young people over the last couple of years, feeling a, a greater sense of hope and possibility, uh, at the, the increase in their social awareness. And mm -hmm. even in those moments where we again, feel like or see that struggle, there is such a deep level <laughs> of awareness and, and possibility. And again, I just, I, exit each day watching the students leave the building and every one of those moments I feel this sense of, of hope and excitement for yeah. what what is possible all, all those things are great I mean I you know I would remind them that struggle is good guys it, it's what supports growth you know keep pushing forward no matter the obstacle it's the obstacle that makes us grow and 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 like never before the world needs more artists amen. Absolutely. Yes. There's the tag. Yes. <laughs> well, I'd like to thank each of you for joining me today. I I have seen your work. I have experienced your work firsthand. And it's your compassion, your leadership, your professional expertise. Schools survive for a reason. And the three of you at the helm, it, it's just so apparent as to what pulls the community together and your leadership. So thank you so much for joining me today. It was really, it was really a pleasure and an honor. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Thanks, Pat. Thank it's always you. great to hang out with these people. Yes. <laughs> Indeed. Indeed. Take care. Indeed. Hey, thanks for listening. If you enjoyed the podcast, give us a like on your favorite podcasting platform. You know, that helps others to find us. We are available on all the big ones, including Apple, 
Spotify, and Podbean. Thanks again. Bye.